Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video, we are covering chapter seven from our Cohen seventh edition Microbiology, a Systems Approach textbook. This chapter covers viruses and prions, so let's go ahead and get started. I got to D, got to D, got to D. Got to D, got to D, got to D. I got to D, got to D, got to D. Explain stuff. All right, welcome back to chapter seven. Again, covering viruses and prions. So let's go ahead with this chapter. What you should know is that viruses are not alive. Viruses are known as small infectious agents. And these infectious agents, what they do is they take over cells. They infect cells and then they make the cell a virus factory. And that cell is reprogrammed to make copies of the virus. And you're not spared. If you are a living organism, there is a virus for you. There is a virus that can infect you. So there are bacterial viruses known as bacteriophage. There are viruses that infect algae. There are viruses that infect fungi. There are viruses for protozoa, plants, animals, archaea. Again, you are not spared. Living organisms have some kind of virus which will infect them. Every type of organism is infected by some virus. But one thing you should know is that not all organisms can be infected by the same virus, right? Viruses have what's known as tropism. Tropism means that uh, it's the range of different hosts a particular virus can have. So, for instance, certain viruses can only infect one species of organism. But other viruses might be able to infect multiple different species. Tropism refers to the variety of different tissues or cells or species that a virus can infect. Some viruses have narrow tropism, for instance, HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, infects specifically the helper T cells or CD positive T cells of humans, while other viruses are known to infect multiple different species. For example, rabies virus would have a more broad tropism. It would be able to infect a more broad variety of different organisms. So it all depends on the virus as to which particular cells it infects. And I'll explain why in a little bit. Now, because viruses are not alive, remember the reason viruses are not alive is because they are not composed of cells. The basic unit of life is a cell. If you don't belong to the domains bacteria, archaea, eukarya, then you're not considered a living entity. Viruses are not cells. They don't belong to any of the three domains of life. Therefore, they are not alive. So instead of saying a virus is alive or dead, scientists use the terms active or inactive instead of alive or dead. And that makes sense. That's because they are small infectious agents. They are not living. And the main reason they are not living is because, again, A, they are not made up of cells. B, they are unable to multiply independently from a host cell, amongst many other reasons as well. Remember the characteristics of life? There are certain characteristics of life, and living things tend to possess most of those characteristics of life. Well, viruses lack most of those characteristics of life. Therefore, they are not alive. Instead, we call them obligate intracellular parasites. Obligate meaning strict or they must. Intracellular meaning inside of the cell. And parasite meaning something that lives and becomes dependent on a host. Viruses are known as small intracellular parasites. They are also small infectious agents. So they are not alive, but they require a host cell 
in order to reproduce. With regard to the size of viruses, they are small. Viruses are smaller than the average bacterium. They are so small that you cannot study most viruses with a light microscope. So in order to visualize a virus, you're going to need an electron microscope. Electron microscopes are required to detect viruses in combination with special stains. Again, viruses are much simpler than cells. Therefore, they are smaller than cells. You can't see viruses if you're studying them with a light microscope, such as the ones we have in the lab. Remember that a light microscope has a resolution limit of one micrometer. Anything smaller than a micrometer is really lost in, to a light microscope. So here you can see a size comparison of a eukaryotic yeast cell. See in, in uh, kind of teal color here, you have a eukaryotic yeast cell, which appears to be budding. And that's quite large. It's about seven micrometers across, right? So seven micrometers, you're going to easily see that with a light microscope, which has a minimum resolution of one micrometer. And then E. coli, remember E. coli and Staphylococcus, or in this case, sorry, Streptococcus. These are bacterium and they are prokaryotic. E. coli is about two micrometers long, so you could visualize it with a light microscope. And Streptococcus is about one micrometer uh, in diameter, and so you could visualize that with a light microscope as well. However, notice that the viruses, besides this ginormous <laughs> Pandora virus, which is about one micrometer, but that's the exception, notice that viruses tend to be smaller than one micrometer, with the smallest viruses being about 22 nanometers in diameter. So again, because viruses are typically smaller than bacterial cells and shorter or smaller than the cutoff limit or the size limit of a light microscope, which is one micrometer, you cannot visualize most viruses with a light microscope, and instead what you're going to need is an electron microscope to visualize viruses. And as I said before, viruses bear no resemblance to cells. They are not living. They are not cells. They lack protein synthesizing machinery. They don't have ribosomes. But they're basically an external coating which is called a capsid protein coat. This protein coat surrounds a core containing nucleic acids, either DNA or RNA. So at their core, every virus is a nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, surrounded by a protein coat called a capsid coat. And that's essentially at the core of every virus is this protein capsid coat surrounding either a DNA or an RNA genome. And as I just mentioned, the most simple structure of a virus needs at least a piece of genetic material in the central core made by one or more nucleic acid strands of either DNA or RNA. Isn't that neat? The genome, the genome of a virus can either be a DNA genome like you and me or an RNA genome. Viruses can have RNA genomes. And remember, surrounding that genome, which is either a DNA genome or an RNA genome, is an external protein coat called the capsid covering or the capsid coat. And this protein coat covers the genetic material. Additionally, some viruses will also have one or more enzymes as well. These enzymes help the 
virus to replicate. A virus is much simpler than a cell. Viral components include, again, a genome. The genome could be either a DNA genome or an RNA genome. This is known as the nucleic acid genome. And surrounding that genome is, remember, a protein coat called a capsid. The capsid is a protein shell that surrounds the nucleic acid genome. By the way, the genome plus the capsid has a name. It's called the nucleocapsid. Nucleocapsid refers to the capsid and nucleic acid together. And every single virus has at its core at least a nucleocapsid. That nucleocapsid could be a genome of RNA surrounded by a capsid coat or a genome of DNA surrounded by a capsid coat. Additionally, some viruses have an envelope. This means a membrane, like a plasma membrane surrounding the nucleocapsid, surrounding the protein coat. Usually, this envelope is a modified piece of a host's cell membrane. I'll show you this in a little bit. Though not all viruses have an envelope, not all viruses have a membrane. The viruses that lack an envelope are called naked viruses. And lastly, viruses have spike proteins. What's a spike protein? A spike protein is found on the surface of both naked and enveloped viruses. These spike proteins are essential to the virus because they're what allows the virus to dock onto the host cell. Without spike proteins, the virus would not be able to attach to host cells and it would not be able to infect any cells. And it doesn't matter if it's a naked virus with just a nucleocapsid or it's an enveloped virus with a plasma membrane or some kind of membrane. Either way, these spike proteins are on the surface of the virus and they allow the virus to attach to host cells. And this is required for infection of the host cell. Now the term for a virus, a specific viral particle is known as a virion. A virion is a fully formed virus, which is able to establish infection in a host. So when I point to a virus, that's known as a virion. And at the core of every virion is the nucleocapsid, the nucleic acid genome plus the protein capsid. And remember, whether that nucleocapsid is naked, like the one on the left, or enveloped like the one on the right, these viruses have spike proteins on the surface. See these, these spike proteins on the surface, which are required for binding to host cells. What these spike proteins do is that they bind specifically to receptors on host cells. Remember I mentioned tropism? And I told you that tropism has to do with a virus's ability to infect a particular cell. Well, that has everything to do with spike proteins and which receptor they recognize. If they recognize a receptor that's only present on a certain cell type, well, only that cell type is going to get infected by this virus. But if these spike proteins recognize a, pro a protein or a receptor that's found on multiple different animals, well, then that means that multiple different animals are going to be infected by this virus. So the spike proteins are so important because it's the spike protein binding to specific receptors on the host cells that dictates a virus's tropism, how many different organisms uh, and different tissues that the virus can infect. Isn't that interesting? And again, regardless of naked viruses on the left or enveloped viruses on the right, 
you have spike proteins on the surface of the cell. These spike proteins are necessary for infection. These spike proteins attach to host cell receptors in a specific way. Without these spike proteins, the virus wouldn't be able to attach to a host cell and therefore it would not be able to infect a host cell. Now I told you what the capsid is. The capsid is the protein coat or the protective outer shell of viruses, but it's not made up of one protein. The capsid is made up of what are known as proteins called capsomeres. Each of the proteins that make up the capsid are called capsomeres. And these capsomeres are identical protein subunits, identical protein subunits that spontaneously self-assemble to form the capsid. So again, capsomeres are the individual proteins which come together to form the capsid. And these are identical protein subunits. There are two main shapes for a capsid. These are the two most common capsid shapes. A helical capsid, which is a rod-shaped capsomere that forms a continuous helix around the nucleic acid, which I'll show you on the next slide. And a cosohedral capsid, which forms a three-dimensional 20-sided figure, kind of like a 20-sided dice if you played any uh, Dungeons & Dragons game, with 12 evenly spaced corners. So let me show you what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a helical capsid versus an acosohedral capsid. Here you can see a helical capsid, helical nucleocapsids. Notice that the capsids are made up of individual proteins. These individual proteins, remember, are called capsomeres. These capsomeres for the helical capsid are rod shape. So these proteins come together to form a cylinder. And these cylinders accommodate the nucleic acid, the RNA or the DNA. That RNA or DNA fits inside of the cylinder and it gets coated by these capsid proteins, which begin to form a helix. And the length of the virus depends on the length of the nucleic acid. These viruses form helices. What, what you see with these viruses is that this capsid forms a long cylindrical tube, kind of like a straw. Here you can see a virus with an electron microscope. That virus is helical in structure. Now let me tell you a funny story. Again, this is a helical virus which has the nucleic acid inside of a protein coat that's helical. It forms a long cylinder which kind of resembles a cigarette, am I right? This cigarette looking virus is actually known as tobacco mosaic virus, which attacks the tobacco leaves of the tobacco plant. Isn't that interesting that a helical virus that looks like tiny cigarettes is the very virus that attacks the tobacco plants, right? Tobacco leaves of the, of the tobacco plant. Isn't that interesting, like an irony of life? Because tobacco leads to cigarettes, you know, and cigarettes are deadly to people. However, the tobacco mosaic virus attacks the tobacco leaves. So it's one of those life's greatest ironies, in my opinion. It's kind of an interesting factoid. Uh, so I, I hope you understand what a um, helical virus looks like. And again, the length of this helical structure depends on the length of the genome inside. And usually these have RNA genomes inside. But that doesn't mean that all helical viruses are naked like this one here. 
Some helical nucleocapsids are enveloped, such as this one. You see inside are the nucleocapsids, and outside is an envelope, a membrane. And this is a flu virus. A flu virus is an enveloped virus which has helical, you can see here, helical nucleocapsids inside. A flu virus is a what's known as a segmented genome virus. The flu virus has several pieces of RNA. There are several nucleocapsids inside of an envelope. And the flu virus is made up of actually eight different pieces of uh, RNA, of nucleocapsid. So a flu virus has eight different pieces of RNA, all as a nucleocapsid inside of a membrane, inside of an envelope. Isn't that neat? Nucleocapsids can have a helical shape. Those shapes can be naked, such as the one for tobacco mosaic virus, or enveloped, such as the ones for the flu, flu virus or influenza virus. Now, the other major shape of a capsid is known as an icosahedral capsid. This looks like a 20-sided dice. If you've ever played uh, Dungeons and Dragons, or even Baldur's Gate 3, you know about the 20 sided dice. Acosahedron are essentially a 20 sided shape, resembling that of a 20 sided dice. And several viruses adopt an acosahedral capsid. A, a capsid with 20 equilateral sides. And these viruses can be naked, where the 20 sided structure, nucleocapsid, is naked with the spike proteins pointing out. Or these acosahedral capsids can also be enveloped, such as this right here. But why the acosahedral shape? Well, it turns out that icosahedron is nature's most effective way of packaging something. So the icosahedron is the most effective way of packaging the DNA or the RNA of these viruses. Now, this leads me to the last type of viral structure. This is known as the complex capsid. Complex capsids take shapes that are not symmetrical. They're not perfectly symmetrical like the helical capsid or the icosahedron. These complex capsids have more to them. Here's an example. This is the famous T4 bacteriophage. This is the virus that infects E. coli. This is the virus that infects bacteria, and it's known as a type of bacteriophage. Bacteriophage are viruses that specifically infect bacteria, and this is an example of a bacteriophage, for example, the T4 phage. This virus obviously is not just a simple shape, is it? It kind of has an icosahedral head. You see, this is the icosahedral head which houses the genome. Usually these guys have a DNA genome inside. And, but then look at this, you have a sheath, which is like an, like a, like a helical, a helical tail. In addition, you have these tail fibers, which serve as spike proteins and tail pins as well. So this virus here is a transmission electron micrograph of this virus. And you can notice that this virus, it's not just one simple shape, is it? It's a complex capsid. It has an acosahedral head, a helical tail. In addition, it has tail fibers and tail pins. In this case, we would call this a complex capsid um, because it doesn't have a particular single shape to it. So again, 
viruses tend to have three different configurations, right? The capsid of viruses can be helical, the capsid can be a cosohedral, or the capsid can be complex. And again, remember, some viruses are non-enveloped or naked, while other viruses have an envelope. That means a membrane surrounding the virus. Here's an example of a naked capsid on the left and an example of a enveloped virus on the right. Here you can see this is the genome, the DNA in the center in green. Here is the capsid in red. And in blue, you have the envelope. So you might be confused as to where these viruses get their envelope. Where do these viruses get a membrane? They're not cells, are they? Remember, viruses are not cells. They are small infectious agents. So where do they get their envelope from? Where do they get that membrane from? Well, it turns out the viral envelope is composed of membrane from the host. Viruses do not create their own membrane or their own envelope. They steal part of the host's membrane. Think about that. Isn't that interesting? So a virus, an enveloped virus did not make its envelope. It did not make that membrane. It stole that membrane from the host. And I'm going to show you how that occurs later on in this chapter. That membrane is usually part of the cell membrane or even the nuclear membrane of the host cell. That membrane can also have spike proteins inside of it. Remember, spike proteins which allow that virus to attach to new host cells. Now remember, viruses have at their core always a nucleocapsid. Now remember, at the core of Every virus is the nucleocapsid, which comprises the capsid coat surrounding a nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA. But what I need you to know is that it's either a DNA genome or an RNA genome, but not both. And that genome contains viral genes, which are normally much smaller number of genes than a typical cell. And that makes sense. Viruses are much simpler than cells. They don't need as many genes as a cell does in order to function. Viruses only need the genes necessary to invade host cells and redirect their activity. Those genes are there to redirect the activity of the host cell and there to, you know, code for new capsid proteins, new spike proteins, new enzymes, and the enzymes necessary to copy all the viral components. Now, how do they categorize or classify viruses? Let me introduce you to the Baltimore system of viral classification. Baltimore is a Nobel Prize winner, David Baltimore at Caltech. And he derived this new method of classifying viruses based on their genomes. Remember, I said that some viruses have a DNA genome while others have a RNA genome. But it's a little more complex than that. Let me explain. Check it out. According to the Baltimore system, Class 1 viruses are any virus with a double-strand DNA genome. Remember that you and I share a DNA genome that's double-stranded, so this is the type of genome that you and I are familiar with. All organisms that are alive, bacteria, archaea, eukarya, we all share double-strand DNA genomes. So double-strand DNA genomes are similar to the genomes of animals and plants and bacteria and archaea. And some viruses have a double-strand DNA genome. For example, herpes simplex virus. These are known as class one viruses. 
What's interesting is class two viruses also have a DNA genome, but these are single stranded. CSS stands for single stranded DNA genomes. These viruses have a DNA genome that's single stranded. For example, parvovirus B, while class three viruses have what's known as double stranded RNA genomes. I know you're not familiar with double stranded RNA. Uh, most of you are familiar with single stranded RNA, for example, mRNA, but double stranded RNA exists. And these viruses, the viruses that are part of class three virus, according to the Baltimore system, are the double strand RNA viruses. These include rotavirus. Class four viruses are actually single strand RNA viruses that have a positive sense. What does that mean? What is a single stranded RNA positive sense virus? For that answer, let's head over to the board. Now, double stranded RNA viruses have two complementary strands of RNA as their genome. However, one strand is known as the positive sense strand, and the complementary strand is known as the negative sense strand. What's the big difference? The big difference is this. The positive sense strand can be recognized by ribosomes. while the negative sense strand cannot be recognized by ribosomes. Why is this important? Well, remember, ribosomes synthesize proteins. And so ribosomes can recognize the positive sense strand of RNA. They can attach to that positive RNA, and they can actually make proteins. They can translate the genes on that positive sense RNA into proteins, while on the negative sense strand, those ribosomes cannot recognize that as information they can use to make proteins. So when we talk about single strand RNA viruses, if we're talking about single strand RNA viruses that have a positive sense, then ribosomes can recognize these uh, genomes. Ribosomes can always make proteins directly from positive sense RNA genomes. However, when it comes to negative sense RNA genomes, if it's a single strand RNA that's negative sense, then you know ribosomes do not recognize that as a you know, something they can build proteins from. So these viruses are at a, you know, disadvantage. They need to convert their negative sense RNA genome to a positive sense before they can make their proteins. And that's the big difference between the positive and the negative sense RNAs of various types of viruses. So now you understand the class four positive sense single stranded RNAs like those found in SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, as well as other viruses like polio virus. And hopefully now you understand the class five negative sense single strand RNA viruses, which cannot be used as our mRNA directly. Remember that Class four positive sense single strand RNA viruses can be used as mRNA directly. That means that ribosomes recognize this type of genome and ribosomes can make proteins by directly binding to positive single strand RNA genomes. While negative single strand RNA genomes cannot be directly recognized by ribosomes. So these types of genomes need to be converted to positive sense single strand RNA genomes in order to be recognized by ribosomes. 
And these viruses include the viruses like influenza virus. Now, class six, these are also single strand RNA genomes. However, the, the thing that makes them their own class, the thing that makes them unique is that these are known as the retroviruses. That's because these are known as the viruses that must copy their RNA genome to DNA before anything else can occur. So these are the viruses that use an enzyme known as reverse transcriptase. This is the enzyme that copies the single strand RNA genome back to double strand DNA so that these viruses can proceed with their life cycle. I can explain this retrovirus at the board. So now let me explain retroviruses. Retroviruses are interesting because although their genomes are single strand RNA, it's a positive sense single strand RNA, which would make you think that it behaves like the other positive sense single strand RNA viruses. However, these retroviruses they're in their own class because the first thing they do is convert that RNA. They convert their RNA, which is a single strand positive sense RNA. They convert that to double strand DNA. So they actually convert their RNA genome to double strand DNA, and then they carry on with the viral synthesis and assembly, etc. Again, retroviruses are unique in that they convert their RNA genome to double strand DNA before carrying on with the rest of the viral replication cycle. And the reason they're called retro is an interesting one. Let me explain that. Do you remember the central dogma of molecular biology, which states that information flows from DNA to RNA to protein? Well, the reason retroviruses have the term retro in their name is because retro means going back. And look what happens with retroviruses. They convert RNA to DNA, which is going back in the central dogma. If you're going from RNA to DNA, you're going counteractive or retro with regard to the normal flow of information according to the central dogma of molecular biology. That's how retroviruses got their name. Isn't that neat? All right, welcome back. And lastly, we have the class seven viruses. These I'm not gonna go into too much detail with, but these are the double strand DNA viruses that have a interesting shape. One of the strands has a gap and the other strand has a nick. And these double strand DNA viruses, they have a unique life cycle, which includes reverse transcriptase, which we're not going to get into in detail in this class. Now, remember when I mentioned that viruses have a nucleocapsid as well as spike proteins? but they also can possess enzymes. Here are just a short list of different enzymes viruses may or may not possess. Polymerases. These are enzymes that can synthesize DNA or RNA. Replicases. These are enzymes which are a type of polymerase that copies RNA. Reverse transcriptase. These are enzymes that synthesize DNA from RNA. Reverse transcriptase can be found in classes six and seven. Integrase. 
This is a scary enzyme that inserts the viral DNA into the host DNA. And protease, an enzyme that cleaves viral proteins to finalize them. Again, some viruses have these enzymes, some don't. It all depends on the virus, but these are some common viral enzymes. Now, I personally prefer the Baltimore system of viral classification. However, you should be aware that there was a previous way of categorizing viruses based on similarities. And this was an informal classification system, which tried to group viruses based on their order, their family, their genre. These classifications included suffixes like virales for the order of the, of the virus, viridae for the family of the virus, and virus for the genre. For example, the order herpes virales includes the family herpes viridae and the genus simplex virus, followed by the species human alpha herpes virus 2. Essentially, the committee, the Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses, in their 2020 issue reported 59 orders and 189 families of viruses. I much prefer the Baltimore system, to be frank. The Baltimore system groups viruses based on their genomes and how the genome is replicated, how the virus is replicated. Remember, there are seven different classes of viruses according to the Baltimore system. However, the old system, which is run by the Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses, tries to group viruses inside of orders, families, genus, species. And as you could imagine, that leads to problems. And this is because viruses are not alive. So trying to categorize them with taxonomical hierarchies similar to that of animals is really not very useful. And again, there are DNA viruses and various RNA viruses and Fun fact, coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, is an example of an RNA virus, coronaviridae, and it is in the genus of coronavirus. So that's pretty interesting to understand. With that, we are about halfway through the chapter. Why not take a quick break time with Gizmo and Wicket and see what these little guys are up to? And we'll be right back for the second half of the chapter. Welcome back from Break Time with Gizmo and Wicket. Now, let's talk about how viruses multiply. What do viruses do once they get inside the cell? This is known as the multiplication cycle of an animal virus. This includes general phases, adsorption, penetration, uncoding, synthesis, assembly, and release. What does adsorption mean? Adsorption is the attachment of the virus to the host cell. Do not confuse the words adsorb with absorb. Absorb means to soak in like a paper towel, like water into a paper towel. Adsorb means to attach. Viruses must adsorb to host cells in order to infect them. And this is done with the spike proteins. Spike proteins on the surface of the virus stick to specific receptors on the surface of the host cell. And this specific binding is what al allows infection to occur. 
And remember, some viruses have a narrow host range. Some viruses have a broad host range. It all depends on the spike protein and the host receptor. And again, the host range is determined by this spike protein to host receptor binding. There are some viruses with a restricted host range. For example, hepatitis B, which only infects the liver cells of humans. You see how that's very restrictive? That's a very sh a small and narrow tropism. On the other end of the scale, you have broad host range or broad tropism viruses, such as rabies. Rabies virus infects all kinds of cells from mammals. So basically all mammals can be infected with rabies virus. So this virus exhibits a more broad host range. It has a broad tropism. So now we've discussed adsorption. This is the attachment of the virus to a specific receptor on the host cell. Next, we're going to discuss penetration and uncoding of the virus. Penetration involves the entry of the virus into the host cell. And this can often occur via endocytosis, where the entire virus is engulfed by the cell and enclosed in a vacuole or vesicle. Here you can see a naked virus which touches the host membrane. There will be specific binding between spike proteins on the surface of the virus and the receptors on the host membrane. This will cause an invagination to occur on the host membrane. This is an inward movement, an inward growth of the plasma membrane. And that pops off as a vesicle, a little virus inside of a membrane vesicle. And at this point, penetration is complete, but uncoating needs to occur. The virus needs to uncoat. It will release itself from the vesicle and the genome will uncoat. Viruses must uncoat, which means that the nucleocapsid needs to free itself from any kind of vesicle and the nucleic acid, either a DNA or an RNA molecule, these need to find their way into the cell so that the viral multiplication cycle can continue. Here is an example of penetration of an enveloped virus. This is an enveloped virus. You have the nucleocapsid in the center and the envelope on the outside the enveloped virus attaches with its spike proteins to specific receptors on the host membrane. This fusion causes the envelope to fuse with the plasma membrane of the host, releasing the nucleocapsid inside of the cell. And subsequently, the DNA or the RNA genome will free itself from the capsid coat, and this is known as uncoating. Following uncoating, the genome can direct the cell to synthesize or make parts of the virus. This includes genome replication, copying the genome of the cell, and protein production, making the proteins of the virus. The viral nucleic acid takes control over the host's synthetic and met metabolic machinery. And the way this occurs varies depending on whether we're talking about a DNA virus or an RNA virus. Because RNA viruses replicate in the cytoplasm, while DNA viruses replicate in the nucleus. Again, let's look at the multiplication cycle step by step. Notice here, the enveloped virus binds to specific receptors on the cell's membrane. This is via the spike proteins. Remember, look at this. This is called adsorption. The virus attaches to its host cell by specific binding of its spikes 
to cell receptors. This determines the tropism of the virus. Here you can see the spike protein in purple is binding to the specific receptor in gray, and this is called adsorption. Next, there's penetration. The virus must make its way into the cell. And in this case, it looks like it's making its way into the cell via endocytosis, where the plasma membrane of the host cell invaginates to form this cavity, allowing the virus to enter the cell. Next, part three is called uncoding. Uncoding occurs to free the viral genome, whether it's an RNA genome or a DNA genome, into the cytoplasm. See, part three, uncoding. The viral genome, whether RNA or DNA, is released into the cell. Remember that RNA genomes replicate in the cytoplasm, while DNA genomes replicate in the nucleus. That RNA genome then undergoes what's known as synthesis. Synthesis includes replication and protein production. Here, during the synthesis stage, more genome is synthesized. So if the genome, in this case, look, it's, an, it's a positive sense RNA genome. The positive sense RNA genome is copied to form more positive sense RNA genome. This is done with RNA polymerase. And this RNA genome, because it's positive sense, can be recognized by ribosomes, which form new spike proteins, new capsomeres for the new capsid, as well as other enzymes as well. This is known as synthesis of new viral molecules. So next, assembly occurs. New virion are formed from the proteins that are synthesized as well as the nucleic acid that is constructed. And lastly, release. Release where enveloped viruses bud, like this one, out of the membrane, carrying away an envelope with spikes. So check it out. Viruses, nucleocapsids can bud they can cause an evagination in the plasma membrane, which then pinches off to form the envelope of the new virus. So when you see a virion, when you see a virus with an, with an envelope, with an envelope, that envelope is actually stolen from the previous host cell during exocytosis. And this process, as we're going to mention in a little bit in a couple slides, this process is known as budding. Budding occurs where the nucleocapsid of the new virion pushes its way out of the cell with exocytosis, and that results in stealing a part of the host's membrane. And that's where I want you to know that that's where enveloped viruses pick up their membranes. They pick up their membranes from the membrane of the host cell. Viruses do not construct their own membranes. Viruses steal their membranes from host cells. So anytime you see an enveloped virus, you should think that it stole that envelope. It stole that membrane from a host cell. So each cell that is infected with a virus becomes a virus factory, a factory that is now instructed to make multiple, multiple copies of that virus. And here you can see an image of viral particles. Each one of these dark spots is a viral particle, a new virion, and you can see how there are hundreds upon hundreds of these virion within the new cell, within the host cell. Again, now we've touched on all the parts of the multiplication cycle of animal viruses, including adsorption, penetration, uncoding, synthesis, assembly, and release. 
but let me go into a little more detail regarding release just to finish off this part of the chapter. During release of mature viruses or virion, naked viruses are liberated usually by lysing the cell, while enveloped viruses are liberated by either budding or exocytosis. This is the same thing actually, budding and exocytosis are uh, interchangeable terms. Remember that enveloped viruses, they do not construct their own uh, envelope. They do not make their own membrane. They budded or exocytosed out of the host cell, and that's where they picked up the membrane. So again, typically, naked viruses are naked because they left the host cell by destroying the host cell and lysing the host cell, pouring out of the host cell, while enveloped viruses are liberated by budding or exocytosis, which results in stealing the host cell's membrane. And in animal cells, this viral infection can lead to damage to the host cell. The damage that's caused to a host cell by viruses is known as cytopathic effects or CPEs for short. These cytopathic effects can damage the cell and alter its microscopic appearance. The cells will look different under the microscope than healthy cells do. The way they can look different is that the cells can become disoriented. They could undergo major changes in shape or size or develop intracellular damage. You could also see inclusion bodies or compacted masses of viruses inside of the cell or damaged cell organelles in the nucleus or the cytoplasm. You could even see syncytia, which are fused cells, fusion of multiple host cells into a single large cell. Viral infection can cause two cells to fuse into one big cell. This table highlights various viruses and their cytopathic effects, the responses in the animal cell. Different viruses can cause different problems, different cytopathic effects or CPEs. You don't need to memorize this, but this is a table showing you how different viruses might culminate in different CPEs. And unfortunately, many viral infections are persistent. There is no cure for these viral infections. They can persist over time. This occurs when the cell harbors the virus, but is not immediately lysed. This can also occur when a provirus forms. This means that the viral DNA actually incorporated or inserted itself into the host's DNA. You can see this with HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, where the host's DNA is invaded by the viral DNA. The viral DNA has inserted itself into the host's DNA. And a chronic latent state can form with certain viral infections. For example, herpes virus, where periodic reactivation occurs after a period of viral inactivity. Now in eukaryotes, it's important to understand that viruses can cause cancer and it is estimated that up to 13% of all human cancers are caused by viruses. This process is known as transformation, the process by which a cell becomes cancerous. A virus might be able to infect a cell and cause that cell to become a cancer. Obviously, not all viruses can cause cancer, but some viruses can, and certain strains of viruses can cause cancer. How? Viruses carry genes that can directly cause cancer, or viruses produce proteins that induce a loss of growth regulation in the cell. Viruses can cause cancer, and certain viruses are known for causing cancer. For example, there are certain strains of 
human papilloma virus that are known for causing cancer, cervical cancer. This is done by either bringing cancerous genes to the cell. These are known as oncogenes or by causing problems in your own genes known as proto-oncogenes. Either way, certain viruses can cause cancer. There are also viruses that specifically infect bacteria. These are known as bacteriophage. Bacteriophage mostly contain double-stranded DNA and Every known bacterial species is parasitized by at least one specific bacteriophage. The most studied bacteriophage are known as the T-even bacteriophage. These are bacteriophage or viruses that infect E. coli, Escherichia coli. They're known as the T-even phage because they have an even number. So for example, T2 phage or T4 phage. These are the viruses that have this complex capsid structure with an acosahedral head, a helical tail, tail fibers which serve as spike proteins, as well as tail pins here. Again, like most bacteriophage, these T2 and T4 bacteriophage contain double-stranded DNA genomes. Now, let's talk about bacteriophage life cycles. The bacteriophage life cycle can be lytic or lysogenic. So let me explain the difference between the lytic phase of the bacteriophage life cycle versus the lysogenic cycle of the bacterial phage. Now here we can see the multiplication cycle of a bacterial phage. Recall that a bacterial phage could enter the lytic cycle, which is demonstrated here as this cycle right here on the right. And bacterial phage oftentimes can also enter what's called lysogeny or the lysogenic state, which is demonstrated here on the left. So let me explain both. I'm going to start with the lytic cycle. With the lytic cycle, we start with adsorption, which makes sense. The virus or virion must attach to the host cell, the E. coli host. Remember that the bacteriophage is this complex uh, virion with an acosahedral head and a helical table tail. The tail fibers serve as spike proteins to bind to the surface receptors on the E. coli host. The bacteriophage then squats down and penetrates the cell. And this is pretty neat. Um, this pink uh, circle represents the bacterial DNA. This is the circularized genome of the bacterium. However, the virus, if you notice, the virus is injecting its double-strand DNA genome into the E. coli cell and it leaves its capsid coat, its complex capsid coat outside. Again, this is known as penetration. Now we have the double strand DNA inside of the host E. coli cell and duplication of phage components ensues. This means that we want to replicate the viral genetic material. This means we want to copy that double strand DNA and we want to synthesize new viral components as well, right? We want to synthesize new capsid heads, new helical tails, new tail fibers, new tail pins, all of the proteins and the nucleic acid of the virus is synthesized followed by assembly where those components come together to form new virion. Lastly, we have maturation. These virion are finalized. And remember, it packaged inside of the icosahedral head. 
is the double strand DNA genome. Finally, lysis of the weakened cell. The E. coli will lyse open, releasing the virion, naked virion in this case, because there was no uh, membrane stolen from the host through exocytosis. This is an example of a uh, cell lysis resulting in naked virion being released so that they can hunt down and infect new host cells. Again, this is known as the lytic cycle of a bacteriophage. But remember, in addition to the lytic cycle, virion can enter once upon penetration, upon penetration, these bacteriophage can enter what's called the lysogenic state, which is more of a dormant or chronic state. Let me explain. Remember that the, the bacterial DNA is represented by this pink circle because it's circularized single chromosome. The viral DNA is here in blue, is, is drawn here in blue. The viral DNA enters the host cell, and during the lysogenic state, the viral DNA can actually insert itself into the host's DNA. See here in pink, you have the bacterial DNA, and the viral DNA inserted itself into that genome. And this is known as a prophage. When the viral DNA inserts itself into the host genome, this is known as a prophage. And this is wonderful for the virus because now that it's inserted itself into the bacterial cell, every time the bacteria divides, it has to also copy the prophage. It has to also copy the viral genome. This is a way for the viral genome to propagate without the virus having to do anything. So imagine the virus just the virus just piggybacks inside of the host cell every time this E. coli doubles. And remember, E. coli can double every 20, 25 minutes. Um, the viral prophage, the viral genome is also replicated. So imagine this, you could propagate your genome, your genetic information without having to do anything. And what happens is this is wonderful because bacteria can, you know, divide so quickly that you could end up with a million cells after just five hours and a million copies of the virus. Now, what can happen, though, is if the bacterium is found, finds itself in a bad environment, let's say that the bacteria finds itself in a nutrition starved environment or in a UV environment, this can actually stress the bacterial cell and viruses, these bacteriophage can sense that the bacteria is stressed. Can you believe it? And when the bacteria is stressed, the virus wants to get out of there before the bacteria dies. Uh, so what happens is the viral genome can excise itself back out uh, and then the, the virus can re-enter the lytic cycle when times get tough. That means that you can duplicate, assemble, mature, and lice out of the cell. Isn't that neat? So again, the purpose of entering the lysogenic state is so that the virus can go into a chronic or dormant state into the bacterium and replicate, uh, you know, by laying low. However, if the bacterium is stressed or might die, the virus will reactivate and it will excise itself or remove itself from the host genome and re-enter the lytic state so that it can exit the cell and find a new host. Isn't that neat? And here you can see with an electron micrograph, an actual image of bacteriophage, these little guys, bacteriophage becoming released from a host E. coli cell. This is the bacterial cell. And notice how the cell membrane has lysed, releasing these naked bacteriophage virion. Bacteriophage that are capable 
of both the lytic cycle here and the lysogenic state here are known as temperate phage. Again, temperate phage can enter the lysogenic state, which was the dormant state, and then they can switch to the lytic phase. And remember, the reason for the lytic phase is to as exit the cell or escape the cell if the conditions become poor. Recall that the prophage refers to the inactive state in which the phage DNA is inserted into the host chromosome during lysogeny. And then recall that when the going gets tough, when the bacterium is starved for nutrients or when it's stressed, this can induce the lytic cycle. This is known as induction or activation of a prophage in a lysogenic cell to progress directly into viral replication and then lytic cycle to release from the cell. And lastly, to finish off this chapter, let's discuss other non-cellular infectious agents besides viruses. There are other infectious agents. For instance, prions. Prions are infectious agents comprised entirely of protein. And these, these prion proteins can cause chaos in the nervous system of animals. Prions are actually normal brain proteins, but these proteins can become unfolded to cause disease. Remember that proteins need to fold correctly in order to function? Well, prion proteins, if they become unfolded or misfolded, they become deadly. This is because once a prion becomes misfolded, it is thought to trigger misfolding of other prion proteins leading to disease. And the disease is called spongiform disease or spongiform encephalopathy. This means that the brain becomes damaged. The brain becomes so damaged that it forms spongiform, which means it has literally holes in it. That's the, this extent of brain damage culminates in a spongy like brain. And this spongy form encephalopathy is a very traumatic and deadly brain disease that forms when these prion proteins misfold in the brain. In humans, there are prion disorders called crutzfeld jakob disease. There's also variant crutzfeld jakob disease. Again, there's no cure for this disease. It causes spongy form encephalopathy, gradual degeneration, and death. Although it's transmissible by an unknown mechanism, it's been heavily linked to consumption of brain matter. There are also several animal examples of similar diseases, these prion diseases. Scrapey in sheep, mink, and elk, and mad cow or bovine spongiform encephalopathy in cows. Lastly, let's talk about another form of non-cellular infectious agent. These are known as viroids. These are comprised entirely of RNA, composed only of naked strands of RNA. They lack any protein capsid or any other type of coating. And these are significant pathogens in plants. They cause several plant disorders. And the way they work is by a process known as RNA interference or RNAi. Certain plant genes are shut off. And this can cause devastating consequences for the plant. And with that, this leads us to the end of chapter 7. I hope it was informative. Thank you for joining me. Let me know in the comment box below if you have any questions, and I'll catch you for the next chapter. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. 
Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.